our first speaker is going to be uh, Mr. John uh, Reisky Dubnik, the Chief Executor Chief Executive Officer of Kaviti, who's here with us from Sweden and doing some important work. And Good afternoon. My name is John Reisky. I'm the C CEO of uh, Kaviti, a Swedish biotech company. And I'm here today to talk to you about HIV. Uh, I'd just like to start by saying I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, I'm an engineer and, as such, a pragmatist, a businessman, and I like to get things done. So today, I'm going to introduce you to a major innovation in HIV treatment that could impact over 30 million people in the next years and have a ripple effect on many millions more in the years to come. But can any of us really fathom the impact on 30 million people? I know I can't. So what I'd like to do today is uh, tell you a, a bit of a story about one person's life and the impact that it could have on one person. So we have two men in their 20s, Alex and Jack, with one thing in common. Four months ago, they were diagnosed with HIV. Um, these names and pictures are fiction, but they're based on real people and events. On the left is Alex. He's a sophomore at UC Berkeley, and he's studying industrial design. Four, one month ago, his doctor gave him some interesting information. He showed him a study that said that his life expectancy with HIV would be 77 years, the same as the non-infected males in the U.S. and his age group. And that's an amazing achievement of modern medicine. On the right, we have Jack, and he works as a legal assistant in Zimbabwe, about 160 uh, miles outside of Harare. He's finishing his apprenticeship next year and plans to go to law school. He also got some good news from his doctor last month. Uh, it told him that now there would be two courses of ARV medications uh, for his treatment in his local clinic. And that is an amazing achievement of international cooperation. Statistically, Alex will die the same age as you or I, having lived a long and productive life. Jack, on the other hand, will be lucky if he survives to see his law school graduation. Today, I'm going to show you how we can level the playing field. This is HIV, and 36 million people have died from it so far. 36 million more are infected. Most of those are in low- and middle-income countries like Jack. What you might not know is that HIV it made the leap from uh, monkeys to humans in the 1930s, uh, but at the time, the immune system could fight it off, much like the common cold. It took another 50 years for it to evolve and get past the immune system, and it, it uses all sorts of tricks, like coating itself with sugar, so that it's mistaken for a nutrient. Once it gets inside the body, uh, it turns on the immune system and starts to destroy it. Next slide, please. Now, once in the body, uh, HIV is different from other virus in that it replicates extremely fast uh, over 10 billion uh, copies in its host every single day. Um, on top of that, and more troubling, is that it mutates uh, extremely uh, prolifically. It has a high genetic variability, which really is its survival tactic. The virus will run up to 70 billion uh, experiments in any one individual in a week. And that's what makes it so difficult for us to come up with a cure or, or a vaccine. It keeps moving the goalpost on us. But there is one thing that we can do to effectively control the pandemic, and that is containment. A policy of containment, and that's how Alex is able to live a normal life today. So what is containment? It starts with understanding the virus through research and sharing that information uh, to create global standards of treatment. Since its discovery in the 80s, it's been the most studied disease uh, in our history. And what we learn is being translated into tactics and policies um, that allow us to manage the disease. But since the virus knows no borders, it's essential that we have global, global treatment standards in place and bodies like the WHO and UNAIDS have led this effort. 
Once we understand how the virus works, uh, we need drugs to at least slow or, or, or curtail its progress. And today we have a range of drugs that will do this. Um, but there's a catch with these drugs. They need to be uh, perfectly timed and, and managed within patients to have the biggest effect. Which brings us to the final link of the containment chain, and that, that is monitoring. Viral load monitoring is an essential tool used to manage HIV patients that are on antiretroviral drugs. This is a PCR machine you see up here that's used in developed uh, nations to pinpoint viral load. Every patient in the U.S., like Alex, has regular viral load tests. Together, these three links have created a successful policy of containment for the disease, but that's in developed countries where only 20% of those affected with HIV live. In Jack's world, which is really most of the world, they've yet to see these benefits. And it's not because they don't have doctors or clinics or um, know-how in place. That's been in place for some time. Uh, and in recent years, the past decade, we've seen over 40% uh, compound annual growth in availability of drugs uh, to these patients, approaching 10 million patients now. Only about halfway there, but there's uh, a lot more availability of drugs. So the real issue now becomes monitoring in terms of containment. The problem is with this PCR machine is that it's highly susceptible to contamination and requires a clean room. And that's very difficult in Jack's world. District hospitals, local labs, almost impossible. So what we have is a problem of access. So when doctors treat in these settings, what do they do? They, they have to guess and use um, basically patient physical appearance, uh, immune system markers in the blood. It's not good medicine. Um, studies have shown that two-thirds of the time when they're guessing, they're wrong. And every time they're wrong, that leads to further people being infected, mutations, and also the lifespan of the patients is drastically reduced. We can change this today. A few years ago, a group of scientists in Sweden set out to fill this monitoring gap. By studying the situation in poor countries, they designed a, a test for viral load that used only the basic, uh, very basic lab equipment. The solution was practical and highly sophisticated. And it was based on a marker called RT, which is always present in a live virus. It's an enzyme. To date, over 53 peer-reviewed journals have, have uh, tested this um, approach and compared it to the gold standard. And it comes up with the same accuracy and precision at a vastly reduced cost and sim simple implementation. It requires no clean room. And I could run this thing in your kitchen and get perfect results. So unlike the PCR tests, uh, the RT test can detect all types and subtypes of HIV, and that's because it's me measuring the enzyme that's always present in a live virus. This isn't theory. Cavite tests have been proven and run in over 400,000 times in over 52 countries, and it has a perfect track record for that. And that makes it good science, but what makes it a good investment is that the WHO has recently revised their guidelines and included viral load testing as a suggested method of management of HIV patients in developing countries. That's the first time ever, just last year. There's only one hitch, and that is that our test is a manual assay. You see all those wells up there being pipetted, there are 96 of them, and it takes time and effort. And certainly if you have a much, much greater population of patients that need to be tested, this doesn't scale. So we have an access problem with our test as well. Next, please. So in fact, on both ends of the spectrum of the access problem, we have PCR at the top and, and RT at the bottom. For PCR to scale down is uh, limited because of the basic science behind PCR. Fortunately, the only thing that limits RT from scaling up is investment, and that's why I'm here today. Here we have a monitoring tool that can close the gap that, we, that exists in the market for the first time and allow a truly global containment 
of the pandemic. It's our manual RT test simply put onto an automated platform that allows us to scale up. We now have a working prototype in the lab, and it's about this big, fits on a countertop, has the same footprint as our manual test. And with your help, I can be ready to take orders for this machine in the middle of next year. I could show you a stack of papers this high that makes an argument for using viral load in resource limited settings. And those studies would tell you that using viral load reduces infections, inhibits drug resistance, and extends the productive life of all the patients that are on ARV drugs. But I'm pleased to say I don't need to make that argument because it's been made for me. Over the past year, major health authorities have identified viral load monitoring as the missing link in the containment chain that I've just described. And this has led to us establishing formal ties with several NGOs and nonprofits, such as MSF, the Load Zero Foundation, and the Clinton Health Access Initiative. In fact, Unit Aid, who's affiliated with the WHO, has identified our test as the ideal solution. We've got the test right now that can complete the, con the containment chain. The market's ready for this machine. It shows, this graph by the Clinton Foundation shows the reallocation of funding to viral load and steady growth through 2020. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't believe first and foremost that this is a sound investment likely to yield a meaningful financial return in excess of market averages. And then, of course, there's Alex and Jack, two young men with very different standards of living and not the resources in this entire room can, can change that. But it doesn't mean that these two young men have to have different standards of treatment, and that can happen today. I hope this seems worthwhile to you, and if it does, you're probably wondering, well, how much to invest in this? And I think I can help you figure that out. Ask your, yourself how much it's worth to level the playing field and have Jack have the same opportunities as Alex, the opportunity to graduate, start a career, see his kids graduate, maybe even know his grandchildren. How much is that worth for one life? Put a dollar figure on it, and then invest that amount knowing that the impact will reach millions more over time. And I thank you for your time. John, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And as you were speaking, I was having flashbacks to a couple decades ago. I saw some of the first AIDS patients at Bellevue Hospital. And what you just described over the last 14 minutes didn't even seem fathomable. We, we were losing patients more to the toxicity of the treatments, and we were really operating in the dark. So this does shine a sense of light, and it's a wonderful way for us to, to end this day and begin discussions tonight.